Hello and welcome round to my house. Now, I'm heading into the kitchen for today's show. Where I'm going to be joined by two of the most talented chefs this country has ever produced. And together, we're going to be serving up a feast that's fit for a king of comedy who's actually related to real royalty. So what are we doing out here? Come on inside, let's get cooking. Are you coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for you today. I'll be joined throughout the morning by stand up comedian, podcaster, and best selling author Josh Whittacombe is in the house. <laughs> Looking forward to that one, and I'm taking a trip to the sunny Marseille and another one of my favourite food adventures to France. The very talented chefs Daniel Clifford and Marcus Waring will be here. <laughs> Uh, multi Michelin stars between the two of them. Uh, and we've got some fantastic recipes of their very own coming your way very shortly. Uh, and with the festive season just around the corner, I thought I'd be giving you a masterclass in Christmas nibbles you're not going to want to miss. Uh, and we're kicking things off today with my recipe for poached pears. Because it's almost Christmas, I'm going to be poaching these in mulled wine. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to serve it with like a savran dough. So savran or a, a, yeah, that, that kind of thing. Uh, we're gonna do that. I think it's really, really nice. But what we're gonna do, first of all, is we're gonna create an enriched yeast dough. And an enriched yeast dough is supplementing one ingredient for the other. So, or the addition of more ingredients to enrich it. So the enrichment starts off with butter. We've got eggs, uh, we've got flour, we've got the standard dough, which is your yeast, your salt, your sugar, and then we've got water. So it's the enrichment side of it from the butter and the eggs and the sugar that, that creates this sort of rum barba or savran mixture that we want. So what I'm going to do is just melt the butter slightly in the pan, and this is where we can add our eggs to this as well. Now, if you are going to do this, you do need an element of time in this because it does need to mix for a decent amount of time. It's not one of these things that you can speed up and do relatively quickly. So you want to make sure that when you're doing this, this machine's going to go, keep going for about 15 to 20 minutes to make this dough. So once we get to that stage, the butter's melted. That can go in here as well, like that. And then a bit of water, all in. Some sugar, this is your enrichment of it. Some salt in there. Your yeast, you go in there. You can use fresh or dried, it's entirely up to you. And then your flour. And then I like to use a paddle, really, for this one. We started off quite slowly to start with, otherwise it just goes everywhere. And you really wouldn't end up with Christmas all over your worktop. But the idea being, this then mixes, and the dough is very, very wet, considering if you're thinking about a bread dough, it's totally, totally different in terms of texture. Not wet as in a batter, um, if you're doing churros and that kind of stuff, but wet as in, it's very, very difficult to roll out. So what you do is you mix it and mix it and mix it. This is where it wants a good sort of 15, 20 minutes, mixing away just on a gentle speed like that. Keep it going, keep it going. It goes lovely and smooth. And then you can either let this prove up or you can retard it. Retard it basically just means pop it in the fridge. Uh, it doesn't allow any heat to it, so the yeast doesn't work straight away. And by retarding it, you can actually keep this. So you can make it, make it the day before, Pop it in the fridge, put it in a piping bag, and then when you want to, you can then take your little moulds. Now, classically, you could do moulds like this. We'll just take a little bit of our butter, which we've got in here, and you can take some softened butter on here, and you would pipe, or you can either pipe or drop the moulds in. If, the mold, if this mixture is really, really wet, you just hold it and pinch the bag like that, but you then pipe this mixture in the mould rather than do what you would classically do, is in boil it all up. So it's a very, very different type of mixture altogether. You can see it's sticking to my hands quite quickly into there as well. So you've just got to be quite tricky with it. There you go. So then what you want to do is prove it. And I'll prove that, leave it in the mould. So it just comes about so three quarters up the side of the mould and then bake it in the oven. Once it's baked, you end up with what we've got over here, these different sort of shapes. This is a savran mould, your classic, classic mould, which is perfect for this. 
Same thing as you pipe it, you pipe it in the center and push it down with a little bit of oil so, it's, so it creates this ring. But then once it's baked, you end up with this nice light sponge sort of cake. But then what you're going to do is soak it. This is where the mulled wine comes in because I'm going to do mulled wine with pears. Now, hopefully, via the power of the internet, we can speak to Jen Fraser from Fraser's Mulled Wine, which I've got some uh, in my hand over here, from the comfort of her own kitchen by the looks of it. Hopefully, I can see you, Jen. Are you there? Hi, I'm here. How now, are you doing? First of all, thank you for being a part of this as well. I mean, you must be extremely busy with this sort of stuff this Christmas time. Absolutely, yes. Obviously, our busiest period. And, um, yeah, absolutely loving it and delighted to be on the show. So thank you for having me. You're more than welcome. Now, it started out... What I love about this story, like many great ideas, it starts off at a party. You and your sister... Uh, drinking your That's own right, sort of mulled yeah. wine. Tell us how it all started then to turn it into a business. OK, so um, it was about eight years ago and we were hosting a Christmas party with friends. We decided to make... I mean, we love mulled wine. We decided to make a big batch and um, everyone was just kind of asking for more all night. Everyone was on the mulled wine. No one was drinking anything else. And I was, I was at the the stove nearly all night serving up and anyway one friend said to me oh you know what this wine's so good you ought to bottle it so it was quite literally the idea went from there so explain to us explain to us what what goes into yours then because many people making it would just look at spices cinnamon vanilla nutmeg bit of clove yeah what makes yours so yeah. special well we actually keep ours kind of quite simple. Um, we've got cloves, we've got bay leaves, we've got allspice, and we've also got cinnamon. Um, and I think what sets ours apart as well is that we really, um, we, we focus on the, making that syrup to begin with. So um, we put the spices together with um, sugar and fresh, uh, freshly squeezed orange juice and then the peel of the orange and the lemon. And then we only add a tiny amount of wine to start with and we really let it bubble. So, you know, and the aroma that you get from that is just, you know, amazing. Once you start that season and you, you get that aroma, it's like, oh, wow, okay, Christmas has started. Well, I, I've got to say, I'm using it now. I'm just going to recap what I've got here. I'm going to poach these pears. Yeah. Poach pears in this is incredible. Like you're saying, you, you're, you're making your syrup. You, you can do this at home, but... Why do it when you've already done all the hard work anyway? Like you say, you can do this at home. You can start off with a syrup with sugar and spices and that kind of stuff and add the wine. But I've just taken a bottle of your, your wine there and I've popped the pears in and you, you can poach them whole. Now, you can either cut them in halves, you can poach them whole, and I, you can actually poach them with the skins on as well. It's entirely up to you. Cook these, depends on what pears they are. Cook these for about 15 to 20 minutes. These well, I've got commerce pears over here, uh, or William pears as well. But you cook these gently for about 15 to 20 minutes. Now, the key to this is make it in advance, a bit like your mulled wine as well. Make it in advance, <laughs> because what you want to do now is allow this to cool down in, the, in this liquor. And this liquor will do twofold. It flavours our little savarons, but it also colour and flavour our beautiful bit of pears. Now, I've added a little bit of port to mine, but it's entirely up to you whether you want to do that. But by taking these pears, look, when they've gone into the, this mulled wine for a decent amount of time, the colour changes. And if you don't keep them in this uh, liquor, then you're going to end up, when you cut them in half, just with the sort of the, the, the flavouring on the outside, not all the way through. But these are gone in here. Now you can add a little bit of orange zest and bits and pieces in there as well. But you cook these ever so gently, like that. And then when we cut them, you can serve these. I mean, I love them. Just with a little bit of Stilton like this, you can take these. But you can see, look at the colour of these. You can have this recipe, Jen. Look at this one. I was going to say, we'll be serving this up next. You're going to be <laughs> nicking this as well. Just before you go, what do you, what do, you do for the rest of the year? <laughs> <laughs> um, I look after my children. I've got a four and a two-year-old, um, and uh, but this is this is becoming quite a big thing now. So you know, it's actually starting. 
I start in January, as it were. You know, it's it's kind of a full time job. So seeing where it goes, to be honest. Well, best <laughs> of luck with it as well. You've got two full time jobs, you. a mum and and selling some of this as yeah. well. But I have to say, this is delicious. And best of luck with it. Thank you for being a part of it. Good Thank luck with everything. Thank you so much, James. Thank you. Take care. Take care. See you later. Bye. Take care. See how amazing is this? Look. So what I've done with this is I've taken the the little bar bars and and you soak them in this syrup. So often with this, this would just be a standard syrup with uh, sugar, water, a little bit of lemon, something like a touch of vanilla, but, and obviously rum. And this is where you get your rum bar bars from. It's from the syrup, not from the actual, the, this, this mixture here. It's the syrup that it sits in. And then we can take our nice little bit of rum bar bars like this, a good, nice amount of clotted cream. And we can just take a nice little bit like that, on there. And then the lovely pear sits on the top. Now you can actually take a little bit more of this syrup as well. This, this nice little bit of mulling syrup. In fact, I'll probably put a little bit in the centre so you break it open. But this, I think with the pears, it tastes amazing. Nice and simple. But you just take the pears and put it on the top. Like I said, you can either do it a sweet way or you can do it a savoury way with a nice little bit of cheese, a few bits of crackers. Easy as that, but it all comes from this. And also, the great thing about this, don't waste this, stick it in a glass, neck it, done. <laughs> all right, there you go, right. Still to come, we've got dishes from Daniel Clifford and Marcus Waring, and I'll be making wild mushroom ravioli for Josh Whittacombe very shortly. But don't worry, because after the break, uh, I'm going to be answering some of your very Christmassy culinary questions. I'll see you in a minute. Now, if I can get a glass from behind this tree, I'll get a little bit. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, I'll be giving you a master class in Christmas nibbles a little bit later, and I'll be joined in the house by the very funny Josh Whittacombe. Uh, but first, I thought I'd have a go at solving some of your kitchen dilemmas. And with Christmas just around the corner, if you couldn't tell already, uh, there's a festive theme to our questions today. So, first of all, we should be joined on the line by Emma, Emma Crawford uh, from Liverpool. Are you there, Emma? I am. Hi. Good to speak to you. Thank you very much for watching the show as well. Now, what's your question for us? OK, so with Christmas dinner, I'm nearly there, but I always let myself down with the stuffing. I've tried sausage meat, but always end up adding in a stuffing mix and it make it into nice little balls that just end up like golf balls that are horrible. Right, OK. So there's two ways you can do the stuffing. Well, there's lots of ways you can do the stuffing. Sausage meat is one of them, but it becomes quite solid. It's more like a meat loaf, OK? That's that one. I'd stay away from that one. The other one, if you want the ball sort of idea, you take the idea that I'm going to do here and you add a little bit of liquid. Now, that liquid needs to be either a touch of milk, a little bit of egg, or a bit of water, or even just the juice of a lemon, something like that will hold it all together. The more glue you put in, like egg, the more it sticks together, but the more it will come out like golf balls at the end of it and solid. So you want a stuffing that's quite sort of crumbly, which everybody quite likes, the correct? Yes. That one. Exactly so, that. That was a good guess, because this is what I'm going to do now. So what I'm going to do <laughs> is I'm going to run through the ingredients for this. So you, you can start off with sage and onion, OK? So sage and onion being your classic ones. White onion, conventional white onion. Chop it all up into pieces, like that. You don't need to finely chop it by hand. You're going to take a blender, all right? So your onion goes in and your sage goes in. So sage leaves are amazing. Try and de-stalk the sage leaves, all right? So just pull the sage away from the stalk. So if you've got plenty of this as well, and you can grow this in the garden, this is amazing, it grows all year round, you can actually fry this. Fry it is amazing. They crisp up and you get crispy leaves as well with it. That's an, another thing. Save that till next Christmas. So first thing we want to do is get to this stage and blend it. We want to break that down a bit first, all right? That's first bit, OK? Then what we're going to do is take some bread. Now, it's entirely up to you whether you use white sliced bread, bread like this, it's also up to you, whatever you want. But you take... This is your bulk part of the sage and onion stuffing. So, basically, this is what you're buying 
if you're buying it out of a packet, which is predominantly bread, all right? So you take your bread, that goes in like this, bit more. Now this is where you can start to change the flavour of this if you wanted to. So if you think things like uh, orange and lemon, great for Christmas time, lemon zest, as well as the juice if you wanted to, but you don't have to. Remember, the more liquid you're putting in, the more golf ball-y sort of stuff you're going to get out of it. So lemon juice, lemon zest, or orange juice, orange zest, or just the zest, it's entirely up to you. But that goes in. Then if you want to sort of festive this up a little bit, these are little chestnuts. These are amazing. You'll get these from the supermarket, but these are the vacuum sealed, sealed chestnuts. They go in, all right? Blend it. We've got some decent amount of black pepper, sorry, first. So, and season it really, really well. So, black pepper, this is salt, so this would be normal. This is chefdom. Salt, all right? Season it really well. Blend it. And it'll eventually, the machine will die down a little bit. A bit more. Lift this off. And Emma, you now have stuffing. Done. Oh. All right. So, <laughs> no, more, no more need for packets, look. You got your nice I little know, stuffing. Um... Now, if you wanted it more solid of that, you can add a little bit of egg. Like I said, a little bit of milk, a little bit of juice of lemon, something like that. Even a bit of water, you can mold it all up and then pop it in the freezer. You can make this in advance. So you make it now, mold it up into little balls, oh, okay. freeze them, and then cook them from frozen. So a little drizzle of olive oil, a little drizzle of veg oil, a little bit of butter, something like that. 20 minutes in the oven, stuffing will be done. But if you want to do, just cook this, a little bit of bay leaf on the top, like that. And you just pop that in the oven. A few little bits of butter over the top before it goes in, so it's not too dry. So I would take a little bit of this. This would be Christmas at my house. So, a little bit of butter That'd over the top. Butter. But you've got to have a little bit of butter on it, haven't you, really? Look, a bit of butter Absolutely. over the top. And then I would pop, the, pop this in the oven. So, in the oven, 15, 20 minutes, like that. 180, 200 degrees, and they've got stuffing done. How's that? I can't believe it's that easy. Well, I try to make it more complicated because it keeps me in a job every Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> True. You don't want to get let, let the game away too much, but this is where you can experiment oh, with different. True. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you can experiment with different flavors. You can put things like hazelnuts in there. I've got these lovely. So you've got uh, apricots. You can blend those up in the machine as well. But that's all it is. It's just 20 minutes in the oven, 15, 20 minutes in the oven, done. How's that for you? I know. Yeah, absolutely. I love the fact that I can make it now, and it's literally one less thing to think about on Christmas Day. Well. Happy Christmas to you, and good luck with the stuffing for Christmas. All right? Oh, thank you so much. Take care. Thank thanks you. for watching. Well, thanks for that, Emma, and hopefully we should be on the dine down by John Inglis. Are you there, John? Yes, James, I'm here. And now, I love the Scottish accent. Now, now the Scotland and the Scotland, you are, you are way north. Way, way north. As far as you go. So, where, where, give us... Yeah. As Give far a, as you go. As far as you go. Well, wh wh how far can you go? Whereabouts are you near? I'm near to John O'Groats. I'm 10 miles along the very north coast. If you stepped off, you'd be in the sea. Wow, amazing. It's a beautiful part of the world there as well. I mean, absolutely glorious. How can I help you in terms of this? So tell me about what you'd like to learn. I, for a number of times, I've tried to prepare lobster as my Christmas dinner. I've never got to the stage where I felt it's been good, succulent, soft, or anything like that. It's always been disappointing. It's always been kind of tough. And so I've usually ended up just slicing it and putting it in a salad. But I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I'd like to see and maybe get, well, find out how to do it properly, and maybe get some ideas from it. Well, first of all, you have the best lobster in the world up in that neck of the woods. Uh, all the way, Scotland, uh, particularly sort of that, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, west coast of Scotland, Northern Ireland, some of the best, best seafood in the world, really is. And when you go further north from where you are, Shetland and Orkney, incredible sort of stuff. So, lobsters, first of all, how to prepare it. Deemed as a luxury item, really, as well, but the, the, 
it's actually quite interesting. When you learn how to prepare this as a, as a young chef, you never... The, the process of it, you get better at it the more you do it, but the process doesn't change. So nature's been amazing. It's, it's actually done a little line on the top of the lobster. You can see on top of there, you've got this little line on the top. It doesn't go all the way down to the tail, it's just on the body part. So the first thing you want to do is you want to remove the claws from the lobster. So claws have got a large... So the claws, the, there's, a, there's a knife and a fork on a claw. It's either a sharp one or a large one. There's always one of each. Now, lobsters can either be left or right-handed, unusually. It doesn't, it's not all on the same side. So these are always the ones that it rips its prey together. This one will hold it together. So remove the claws, we'll look at that in a minute. The first thing you do is you break this down in terms of what we do with the lobster over here. What you want is a knife that you, you kind of like, but uh, is quite industrial. So I wouldn't use one of these sort of fancy Japanese knives for this, because the blade is too fragile. Use a nice sharp knife, a solid knife, really. And what you want to do is you hold the lobster down, hold it, and, and then press it halfway between the head part and the base of its back here. Press it down right down the middle, all the way down, and. In one movement, you crack it right the way through. Right the way through onto the board. Turn it round the other way. And where you've cut this part, you do exactly the same way, but along the back here. Following that line all the way down. And you end up with half a lobster. Then what you do, and this is the interesting bit that we do, is we take this part, this is all meat. Now, all of this is edible. All of it. So people look at this and go, I'm not eating that. It's all edible. The bit that I take out is just here, which I'll show you in a second. But we take the, the tail meat out like this. And then you invert it. You put that tail meat in there. And that tail meat in there. So now it looks like you've got a bigger portion. All right? But you're inverting it. Are you following so far? Then what we do with the head bit here, there's just the little bit in here, yes, the, little, yes. the little gubbins out of here, I just remove. There's just a little bit on here and a little bit on there that I just take out, all right? Now, just because it's not, it's not, it's not like dead man's fingers, are, are, of course, on a, on a crab, which aren't, by the way, poisonous. They're just unpleasant to eat, really. Um, you've, you've got your nice bit of lobster over here. So that's that bit. Then I would put that onto your little tray there, like that. That's that. Because then what we could do, just have a quick wipe down, is we can then look at our claws. Now, our claws, we can break this down into three parts. So it's the same on each claw. You've got the main part of the claw, which is there. You've got the sort of elbow bit, which is here. Think of it like your hand. This bit's on here. This bit is this bit, and this bit is this bit. So what you want to do is to break it down. The easiest way to do that, it falls in one direction is to take it to the other direction so it just breaks. Same thing with this one. The opposite, it falls one way, break it till it snaps the other way, like that. So you can break this down. Now, you can use a lobster pick, you can use a skewer. And I always go in the, the big end first. So you start off with a little bit, but this big end first. Take your skewer and then prise the meat out like that. All right, that's one out of this bit. This one over here, sometimes you'll be able to get it out in one go, like this. But what I do is just take the back of a knife, give it a tap, and the shell break up, breaks open. It and allows you to take the meat out whole. So you've got a nice little nugget of meat, all right? Same thing again with this one. This is the quite tricky bit. What you want to do with this, to get the meat out of this, it's actually pretty straightforward, to be honest with you. You take your knife, you put it the back of the knife, so not the blade, you almost use your hand as a little guide to stop the knife from going all the way through. If I didn't have that whack it, it would just break the shell all the way through into the meat. So you, your, your fingers are holding the knife like that, stopping it. You can see that? Just hitting a little bit. And you want to tap the top bit like that, so it just breaks. So that's that bit. Take this part of the claw, so the claw's going this way, you snap it the other way, like that. Pull that out, and then you pull the meat out, you end up with that, all right? So then you get more confident, you can do go a bit quicker. So then you would break this, again like this. You'd break it open. You end up with that big nugget of meat there. 
And this one, same thing again, give it a whack, give it a whack, open it out, snap the claw, pull, and pull it out. Now if that bit comes out like that. So then you've got all the shells over here, which we can keep, like that. And then we can bring our bits and pieces across like this. And then the idea being you take a little bit more of your lobster into there, the claw goes onto there, and the claw goes onto there. How is that, John? Thank you very much, James. Thank you for joining us as well. You're in a magical part of the world. You really, really are. I'm very, very jealous. So thanks for watching. <laughs> Thank you, James. All there the you go. We'll all be around for John's house for supper. There you go. If you've got any questions or anything to do with food, then do drop us a line to one of the addresses on the screens right now. We'll try to answer them on the future shows. Uh, still to come, I'll be giving you a masterclass in Christmas nibbles, and we've got dishes all the way from chefs Daniel Clifford and Marcus Warren. But don't go anywhere, because after the break, I'll be chatting to comedian Josh Widdicombe and rustling up an amazing wild mushroom ravioli. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, coming up, me and my trusty 2CV are taken to the track on a food adventure to Marseille. And my good mate, Chef Daniel Clifford, will be cooking for us very shortly. But first, I'm here with a stand-up comedian and the star of The Last Leg, who's turned his love of the 90s TV into a best-selling book. It's the brilliant Josh Whittacombe! Hello! Hello. Hello. Ching, ching, ching. Welcome to the house. Oh, this is such a pleasure. Having a good time? Yeah, I can't believe I'm... This is work, right? This is work. This for is both where you, of us. This is where you have to get to have a drink, <laughs> I cook for you, and you just talk about yourself for the next... Oh, mate. My favourite things, right? talking about myself and food. Yes, please. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> so, we're going to do... Um, we're going to do a nice little ravioli. Wild yep. mushroom ravioli. Uh, we're going to do beautiful wild mushrooms over here. Nice little bit of ravioli. We're going to make our little uh, pasta. We've got some uh, semolina flour, some double zero flour, and some eggs. And I'm going to roll it onto here and make a nice little ravioli. Uh, because you're vegetarian. I am, yes. But not just a current vegetarian. Been... I've always been a vegetarian. Been vegetarian. So my parents are vegetarian. Right. So I don't really know what I'm missing. No, you're not. Trust me. Well, you've only tried meat once, haven't you, by mistake? Yeah, I, I tried. Well, I tried is, an, is a big word. But I uh, basically, I, uh, I mistakenly ate a 12-inch steak Subway. <laughs> 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 Did you get through it all before you realised? Yeah, I did. I, so I was, I, now, this is going to surprise you. I was drunk. Right. right. And um, so me and uh, Alex from The Last Leg, it was, we were in Rio right. filming The Last Leg, and it, it was like 2am, it was after the final show. We went to Subway, and they gave us the wrong Subways. But I was... What, you had his? I had his he, and he had mine. Right, OK. And then I only realised because... Um, it had, at the end, I was like, I didn't order cheese sauce on mine. What? And he didn't realise. He didn't realise. You're a proper drunk man. Yeah, we were hammered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so the only time I tried steak was really hammered in Rio. Yeah. Right. And but I ate the whole thing without realising. I just presumed it was like kind of fake meat thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, I was now, like, they're really realistic, these meats in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm, we're going to get onto your book in a minute, but growing yeah. up as a kid, you, you know, you had a great childhood as well, yeah. down, in, down in Devon. Yeah, middle of nowhere, mate. Absolutely. This, this was the metropolis compared to Devon. Right. Um, so I grew up in a primary school. I had four children in my year. And we had a secretary, and she only came in three days a week. Right. So if you phoned the school on a Thursday or a Friday, we had to answer the phone. <laughs> the kids. Like... <laughs> <laughs> and then for food, right, yeah. your love, um, we, um, we didn't have a kitchen. Right. So when we were answering the register, Rather than saying here, you had to say packed or dinners. Yeah. And then one kid was tasked with counting the amount of kids that said dinners, and then they'd phone it through to the neighbouring school with a kitchen who'd send across the love food. <laughs> <laughs> so where did your, where did, when did your love of comedy start then? Because you, 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 right throughout your teens, you wanted to do something completely different. Well, this I, was, when I was a teen... Manchester yeah, University I moved, you were studying as well. I moved to Manchester University because I basically just didn't want to... I wanted to just go and live in a city. Do you know what right. I mean? And I liked Oasis, so I chose Manchester. Um, but is I... That, that, that was literally... <laughs> no, also, I also liked the Smiths. It was that simple. That was the reason. Yeah. And uh, so I moved to Manchester. Um, now, growing up, I suppose I just loved comedy on TV. I was obsessed with comedy on TV. But I didn't think I could do it. 
I didn't think it was an option, because, you know, you yeah. live in Devon, you don't know anyone that does it or anything. But was there a moment that you, you go, this is what I want to do for a living, or somebody told you? Because often when you speak to comedians, it, there's, a, there's a moment where you go, this guy's really funny at either no, college more, or... When it, it was more the moment I realised I hated my job. Right. And so I thought, I've got to do something else. So I kind of... So what um, was your job at that, that moment in time when you realised that? Well, um, I was a... I worked uh, at the Fedora the Explorer magazine. Um, Interesting It was job. an odd job. Yeah. But uh, I didn't feel it was my life job, so no. I started doing stand-up. And, and how do you get into stand-up? How did that happen? I just booked... You just book in a gig. I know that sounds mad, but the only way to do it is to, what like... What do you mean, just book in a gig? You just... So you just Google open mic gigs in London. Right. And then I booked in, like... You can just turn up and do these gigs where everyone's doing five minutes. And so I just booked in a gig. And the first one went quite well. Um, and that kind of pushes you through for the next two years when do you're Do you remember dying. the first joke that you said or not? No. No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to forget about that? Or is it something you can't mention on TV? Except... It was about E17. Right. <laughs> which now, looking back, feels like a strange decision. To me. <laughs> okay. Strange way to build a career that's headed here. But, um, yeah, it was about E17, but I can't remember what it was. And my whole first set was about... In fact, Christmassy, it was about um, the song Stay Another Day by E17. But I don't... I... I'm not going to do it for you now. No, go on. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about the book then, because this is this this is I've been reading about this because it is quite fascinating. Growing up, you've based it all on TV programs in the yeah, 90s. Yeah, well, I when think I grew up, up in the 90s and I'm obsessed with kind of the 90s, as yeah. a lot of people my age are. And I wanted to tell the story of growing up in that decade. And I thought the best way to do that was through the TV shows we watched because TV was so central to our lives. And so each chapter. It tells the story of growing up in the 90s, but each chapter starts by discussing a different TV show, be it Noel's House Party, Neighbours, TFI Friday, or Beatles About. Cos back then, you know, I mean, TV, TV's popular now, but back then... Oh. Make colossal. TV, yeah. Talking Beatles I mean, About, talking yeah, 15 you, million exactly. people. Exactly. And now, if we do the last leg, we get, like, one, one and a half million on a good week, and you're like... I remember doing Ready, Steady, Cook back in 1990. I'd have been watching that. Yeah. With the bandana on. I yeah. remember stepping out on a Friday night of, with a red, uh, uh, green peppers, red tomatoes, and there was 13 million people watching. Yeah, it. it's mad. And now... And that's the thing about, the, like, how popular TV was. Like, you think back to the 90s, you think, like, oh, it's all about Oasis or it's about, you know, Oasis or Blur or whatever. Definitely, maybe, the biggest Oasis album sold two million copies. Ready Steady Cook's getting 13 million people. <laughs> what I'm telling you is you were more important in the 90s than Noel Gallagher. I don't That's know right. whether I was. <laughs> <laughs> Like Brian to... Britain was bigger than Liam Gallagher. You were bigger <laughs> than Noel Gallagher. It felt like that at moments in time. We used to be, yeah, yeah every single minute, minute of the day, it was crazy, absolutely yeah. crazy. Anyway, look, we've got a little bit of Madeira. I've got some onion stock in here. You make that um, uh, uh, cooking onions just with the skins on, roasting them on and cooking them as per normal. Uh, and then in here, I've got some lovely little bits of tarragon, which I'm going to add some fresh tarragon to this, and a bit of cream. And all I'm going to do is just take our ravioli and cook it in plenty of salted boiling water and add this when it's, when it's cooked. We take a little bit of cream in there as well. That all gets mixed in. So I was thinking this, when I was... Uh, what my favourite TV show was, but I remember, so was it growing up as a young kid, it was necessarily... It was TV shows, but it was also computer games. And mm. you must have... You'd be growing up... Yes, yeah, so computer games. We talked games. about Daily Thompson track and fields before... Yeah, Daily Thompson, where you're like... Like this, people yeah. wouldn't know about it. But yeah. they're iconic ones, and I've got these iconic ones. Now... This this will bring back memories of, of viewers watching this. If you if you remember this one, yeah, now, this one when you switch it on, this noise that you missed. This is Astro Wars. It's Astro the... Wars. I can't see anything, James. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Happy with that? This is the yeah, first guest that we've what, had on just me. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine, carry I'm going to say it, this wasn't built for studio lighting, this That's stream, was it? <laughs> <laughs> it's built for, like, a dark teenage bedroom rather than... <laughs> oh, I've gone. <laughs> You're dead. So, right, look, we've got that lovely little ravioli. I'm just going to pop this in here, but we're going to talk loads more about the, your book and bits and pieces. But I've got to talk about The Last Leg as well. I yeah, mean, that, yeah, I mean what an iconic show as well. I mean, it's been, I mean, also, shows like that, if, they, if they're good fun to do, they come across... 
that on screen yeah, as well. I think that's what you want, right? It's that it feels like if we're not having fun, that would come across because it's live as well. So yeah. you can't can't like cheat it in any way. And so. Um, yeah, we've been doing it nine years I now. Know, it's unbelievable. You know. oh, you're telling me. Do you know, I signed, <laughs> I signed up for 10 episodes right. thinking it would do for the Paralympics in 2012. Basically, I signed up because I thought I'd get some free tickets to the Paralympics. Yeah. And before I know it, you know, it's kind of snowballed and then... It's, I was going to go on holiday instead of doing it. I'm glad I didn't, because it's changed my life so, so much. You say, so you say it's changed your life, because... Has it really? Because you were doing, you were doing the comedy circuit bits yeah, and things but, like that. It's so difficult to get a show like that that works. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You, it's it's rare that a show, you know, the chemistry and the it was a stroke of luck and the kind of whole feeling of the show and it's developed and it's rare that you get a show that will last that long and have that kind of. Because um... did did all of you know each other before? I first met Alex yeah. on the day of the first show. I'd never met him before. Right. And uh, I'd met Adam once before the show. So we didn't know each other at all. It was... I think Adam and Alex had met once to do a pilot. Yeah. Which I wasn't invited to. Right. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, presumably, it went badly, so they had to get me in. That's right. what I'm viewing it as. Yeah. And then... Um, I, so that was it. And then it all started during the Paralympics, and then they were like, oh, this is quite good. We should try it on a Friday night, talk about the news. And you're like... I don't, didn't sign up to talk about the news. <laughs> because but what's, what's we... fascinating about it is the guests that you have as well. You can have... MPs and, and yeah, and you're, it's 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 we've such had... a random combination of guests. So That's the... mad, yeah. And you, so we had Al Gore. We've had um, we've had who else have we had? But it uh, works. Caitlyn Jenner. Yeah, it really works. And Peter, do you know why people like to come on the show? Because it's live. So they're done in twenty minutes. Yeah. Bang! You go to a normal TV show. You might, you know, more normal interview show. You might be there for three hours. This, you turn up at. Eight, you, you're gone home by 11. It's Whereas this one, it's not live, but we kick you out after 16 exactly, minutes. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. The beauty of this one, though, is you get fed and watered. We don't do that at the last leg. All oh, right. <laughs> so there's your, there's your nice little bit. So we're doing the little, little bit of the wild mushroom. Yeah. Ravioli. Oh, that looks Over lovely. here. And then I've got on this... This is just a, a little bit of oil that you... It, it's fresh herbs that oh, you lovely. blend with a little bit of oil. Yeah. And then we take some Parmesan cheese. Over the top. So we take some grated pies out of the top. Right. And there you have it, your first dish at my oh. house. Thank you so You're much. Gonna stick around because I'm going to cook for you a little bit later as oh, well. Great. I'm going to do you a dessert a little bit later, oh, but there you have it. Wild mushroom ravioli uh, with a little bit of Madeira sauce. Done. <laughs> Josh, there you go. Oh, this looks amazing. Wild Thank mushroom you. ravioli. Oh, wow. Take this away. But tell me what you think. Take away Astro Wars. Take away... <laughs> well, I did have Donkey Kong <laughs> over here. Donkey Kong Jr., which is, which is awesome, this thing. That is so nice. Happy with that? Oh, glorious. Well, you're going to stick around as well. Absolutely. Uh, exactly. We'll, we'll cook for you a little bit later as well. But there you go. Uh, uh, right, we've got a stunning dish in store for Josh a little bit later, and I'm off on a food adventure to Marseille very shortly. But join me again after the break when two star Michelin chef Daniel Clifford will be firing up the stoves. I'll see you in a bit. It's nice, that, isn't it? So nice. Welcome back. Now, I'll be giving you a step-by-step -step guide to making Christmas nibbles in this week's Little Masters, and there's plenty more to come from my guest, Josh Widdicombe, a little bit later. But first, I'm here with one of the most exciting chefs working in the world right now, not just in the UK, in the world right now, from Cambridge's Midsummer House. It's a brilliant Daniel Clifford. And I say that two stars for how many years? Uh, 17 now, James, yeah. Not too, not too bad, is yeah, it? It's not, not too shabby. Bad. No, no, it's, it's good, yeah. We're <laughs> still pushing for that third, but, you know, you never know. So. You'll get there, you'll get there. So what's... This is unusual. You're going to do a dessert. You don't well, often come, come No, here, I've never done a dessert with you, so today I thought I'd do something very special. It's coming into that season of artichokes. We've, um... I've always tried to use an artichoke in a dessert because I like that shock element. So this dish is pickled roses, 
Jerusalem artichoke crema, which is like a mousse without any air, and then a lychee sorbet. We, we use rose water, but we use the artichoke in very different formats. So this format here, this is a Jerusalem artichoke, which I've diced raw, peeled them, diced them raw, and then I've blanched them until they're just soft in a stock syrup, which is a 50-50, which means 50% sugar, 50% yeah. um, water. Brought them to the boil, cooked them till they're soft, and then we've put them in an oven about 45 degrees, and we've dried them until they come... Quite they soft. go quite gummy, yeah? OK. So they're dried enough to become like little sweets. So, so they almost look like sort of mixed peel. Yeah. But they've got that lovely, sweet artichoke flavour. So what I do is I put them in the centre, Right. And we build, like, this is what the, the sorbet is going to sit on. Because it's got the texture of mixed peel, hasn't it? But the... Yeah. So, right, right, now what I've done is I've got some rose water, but I've rode... We use Italian rose water because it's got a better flavour. So I've just put 100 mils of uh, rose water, lemon juice, because right. I've, I think the lemon juice, need, you need the acid on this dish, and I put one leaf of gelatine per 100 mils. That's the recipe. I don't know if you but rose water reminds me of my gran. Well, exactly. Nothing wrong with my gran, but my no. gran's toilet. Yeah. Well, <laughs> nothing wrong with my gran's toilet. It was it was that sort of lovely shade of purple. Yeah, and it's that smell that we all uh, rose water. Yeah, yeah rose water <laughs> and uh, lavender. It's all flavours or, or smells that we remind for our childhood. And this is it. When you taste this, I'm a hundred percent sure today. I'm sure that you're, you're going to be blown away. But I'd be honest with you, when when you look at the ingredients, you ask yourself the question of, is this really going to work? Because yeah. they are all quite flowery. Uh, okay. That smells. So what I do now is I've put the rose water in there, and we're going to let that set. I'm going to put that in the fridge. Right. Freeze. It is, it is amazing. I mean, the, the flavour of that artichoke that you get from that, you get the texture of this sort of mixed peel, but. They say it's sweet as well, it's delicious. So, as you see, that's now set, yeah? Right. So, that is going to sit on here. OK. So, I've got to make Where these... Where does your idea come up with? Do you start off with the artichoke go, I want a dessert no, this, out of this? this one started with the twill. So, right. we wanted the flavour of the artichoke. I started with artichoke. I said to myself, right, OK, what can we do? We made a mousse. I, I didn't like the grainy texture of it, so then right. we uh, worked backwards, and then we made it into a crema, which we're going to get to in the middle. But th okay. to start with, we made a twill mix. Now, a twill right. mix normally is flour, sugar, butter, some people put honey, yeah. and icing sugar, and you get a mixture. So I wanted to make biscuits like this. So we made the original twill mix, and we tried to put uh, artichoke puree through it, but right. it was too wet. The became too sloppy. Yeah. So what I did, this is what an artichoke looks like. So, you know, it's a, it's a difficult ingredient to start to work with. Yeah. Peeled them, dried them in the oven. Yeah. So that's how they come out once they're dried. <laughs> then we blended it so it turns yeah, into I a flower. mentality, I love it. <laughs> well, the yeah. thing is, this is the beauty of my job. I just get to play all day. So yeah. I, I, I do things. Yeah. You should see the things that don't work. <laughs> <laughs> this is the funny thing, is I bring to you what works, but there is a lot of uh, disasters <laughs> yeah. back at home. Yeah. But, so we make a flour. Now, right. the thing is, because all we're doing with this is... So, this is, uh, this is the twill mix. As you can see, I've got three different nozzles here. Yeah. So it just makes it easier to the piping. And then just pipe that along. Right. So we get thin strips. See, where do you get even that bit of kit from? This is what I do when I go home. I just, I just. Where do you even get that from? Well, you should. It's free, free. It's I a lot quicker. It's better than water. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So that goes into the oven at 180 until they're crisp. And then, when they come out, we just slice them down and we get some really nice matchsticks. Right. So Lovely. now we're on to the dressing of the plate. Right. So tell everybody about your. Plate. I said 16, 17 years to start. Yeah. You, what what. Made you go to Cambridge in the first place. What took you there? Uh, Midsummer House. That was 100% Midsummer House. I, I was working in Leeds, uh, wanted to do something for myself, uh, found this two bedroom house on the common. Uh, saw, saw, there was nothing in Cambridgeshire at that point. It was yeah. like a gastro uh, hole. And I said to myself, I can buy this. I can afford to buy this. We can afford to make it work. Little did I know, <laughs> the <laughs> first 10 years I weren't going to make a penny. Yeah. But I'll be honest with you, once, you've, once I got my teeth into it and started to think, I got the first star in 2003, second star came in 2005, and we've been doing it ever since. Was it the two stars that put it on the map, was it? Or, or was it...? Well... Because <laughs> to try and get a table at your place is a nightmare it's anyway. It's difficult now. Yeah. Back then, I think... Uh, 
TV's changed everything, James, if you want yeah. the truth. Doing, doing slots on the TV has changed the way the customers look at the restaurant. You know, the, f the phone will blow up after this, so it's... Uh, it certainly it's, will. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you what, the pastry chef's not going to be happy, I'll tell you that for a fact. <laughs> so what I've done now, this is a lychee yeah. sorbet. So right. the, the, the trick to this yeah. and is don't use fresh lychees, use the tinned ones, because the tinned ones taste so much better. And you get such a better... You get such a better sorbet from it. So you've just taken that with sugar syrup. Just sugar syrup, put it through a package yet. Yeah. And literally, that sits on top of there like that. Yeah. Then I take... A cra this is a Mont Blanc nozzle, so I don't know if, if we, people can see this, but it's a nozzle that's got five or six holes in the top, and right. it, it's for a very special dessert called a Mont Blanc. So this comes out... So this is the famous dessert done with chestnuts. Yeah, chestnuts usually. at this time of year. Yeah. So that sits on top of there. I love the way that this, this guy's brains work. You just think... Right, well, this is this is this is a game going. What are you doing? Well, then, right, so now what is this now. So I've taken the roses. These just normal roses. Yeah, these. just normal like roses you buy from the supermarket. These are I've broken them down into petals, and I'm now I'm going to barbecue them on a Japanese barbecue. But what we've done is I've made a rose petal vinegar. I've slightly sweetened that, and. Um, this is the thing, a pastry chef's not a pastry chef anymore because now he's barbecuing. Now, interestingly enough, you, you, in, in lockdown and everything else, you've, you've changed your focus. You've said you've fallen... Last time you were here, you said you've fallen in love with your food more 100%. than you ever have. You've, you've had to diversify, you've had to change, your menu is different, your whole ethos is different. I've, I, I, I'm, I'm the happiest I've ever been. And I know that's really strange, and I think what lockdown did for me is it gave me some time to reflect on what I liked doing and what I didn't like doing. Yeah. And the enjoyment of what cooking actually is. And now we're cooking like we've never cooked before. Because, see, as you can see, now I'm starting to get that lovely charred... Look at that. ..texture. Yeah. yeah. So they come off. You want... that? What I do is the, the sugar in the, in the vinegar will start to uh, crystallise on the grill, yeah. and that gives you that lovely little caramelised flavour. And it's brilliant. So, right, what I do now is, as you can see, the sorbet's sitting up really nice. Yeah. Now we put the twills. Love this. And it's just... Do you know, food should be fun. And this is where I think... This is bringing out all the flavours that I love. It's also bringing out the textures, cos you're getting the crisp from... But it's strange that the sorbet doesn't melt. The, the, the crema sits there really, really See, well. See, anybody that wants to learn and understand the art of multi-Michelin star food, then you've only got to watch you, the, the effort that this goes into. And you're serving how many people a day doing this? Uh, we do 100 of these a day. Ay, ay, ay. Well, yeah, but it's... it's, it's no, no, it's one, great. This is one chef's job. Yeah. He, he, he gets to do this every single day. Oh, he's going to be really happy with yeah, you with yeah, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right, so now what I've done here, this is a syrup of the, re the reduction from... Uh, so you've got it, the vinegar in there reduced down, it becomes a caramel. Right. And then this literally just goes on top of there. Just like that. It feels strange not cooking. So give us the name of this, then. So this is uh, Drusa Martichoke, rose water and lychee. Brilliant. Right, I'm looking forward to this. Never had a dessert out of artichokes. <laughs> I don't think many people have, actually. <laughs> Love the idea of this. You know when you're on, you cook that scallop dish, and it upset yes. a lot of chefs saying yes. it was the best dish I've eaten on the show. That's the best dessert I've ever had. Thank you, John. Thank you. It's unbelievable. It's just a shock to the palate. I think that's the difference. So often with, with dishes, you go, you taste it, you go, that's amazing. You have to tell the camera what, what on earth's going on. I've got no idea what's going on with that. Honestly, I've got no idea, because you've got this... The lychee is bang. Then you get the aftertaste of the rose petals yeah. way after the, the end of it. There's so much going on there, and it's, it's fantastic. Daniel Clifford, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you. A genius. Thank you. Right, Marcus Waring's got to try and trump, trump that dish uh, with the recipe. He's going to be cooking later on in the show. And uh, still to come, I've got Josh Widdicombe as well. But after the break, I was swapping wintry Hampshire for sunny Marseille on another one of my fantastic food adventures to France. I'll see you in a minute. This is amazing. Thank you. Where are you going? I'm getting something out of the freezer. All right. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, this week's masterclass is a lesson in Christmas nibbles, and I'll be laying on lunch for my guest, Josh Widdicombe, very shortly. But before that, I thought I'd take a look at some of the dishes you've been cooking at home. And it's great to see how many of you have been inspired to try these recipes that I've been cooking on the show. So first, we've got Elizabeth Midgley, who um, made herself a midweek evening meal of moule. Look at that. Moule marinier. Amazing. This is the before bit. That's the after bit. What I want to know is what was wrong with those four mussels that were left over there. Um, well done there to Faye Broughton for making this lovely looking quiche, mm. like the one I made in a little mask class a few weeks ago. And I did another mask class in Kedgeree recently, and it looks like that's inspired Ruth Korth to get cooking. Great stuff there, Ruth. Looked delicious. I'm sure it tasted wonderful. And finally, top marks goes to Lorraine Forbes for her photograph of a sticky toffee pudding. How good does that look? It's like a picture from a cookbook. Uh, right, it's time to take a look back at one of my favourite food adventures. This week, I'm in France and in Marseille. Well, me and Keith Floyd's old car, an old 2CV that happens to be in my garage now, uh, we're taken to France and we follow the tyre tracks of some of the most famous names in motorsport. Enjoy this one. I'm nearing the end of my gastronomic ramble through Marseille, but those who know me know I have another obsession aside from food, and that's cars. So when I remembered that the circuit Paul Ricard was just down the road, well, I couldn't resist paying a visit. Paul Ricard is perhaps most famous as the creator of the Pastis Liqueur brand named after him. But a fellow car nut, Paul also built this world-class racetrack back in 1970, and it's gone on to host French F1, MotoGP, GT Championships, and now me, cooking egg and sausages. Now, the guys here promised me that if I cook this dish within 15 minutes, I'll be allowed out there. So here we go. Now, I'm going to do a variant of piperade because the last time I was here, I was in one of those garages and I cooked a similar dish to this for breakfast for my bunch of spanners. That's mechanics. Now, this dish originates, if you go down the pit straight, go right the way across until you hit Spain, more or less, that's the Basque country. This is from northern Basque in France. So the first thing we're going to do is chop the onions. You can do this with chicken, you can do this with... Uh, I've seen it done with fish before as well, but I'm going to use these amazing merguez sausages, which I'll get onto in a minute. So a good drizzle of oil. Now, I'm going to use a couple of onions for this, because this is kind of like... A fantastic breakfast dish, I think, because it's got eggs, it's got sausages in it. It's wonderful. In we go with the onions. Bit of garlic. Now, the reason for the noise is twofold. Not only will we buy a race circuit, there's an airport over there, and there's some quite lucky guy practicing landing and taking off in a very expensive helicopter over there, but in we go with the garlic. Now, I say this is a variant of sort of piperade, and I say a variant because I'm going to use these. These are merguez sausages, and the French absolutely love these. Originate from northern Africa, but they're sometimes made out of mutton and sometimes beef. But if you can buy them in the UK, these are absolutely amazing. They're called merguez, brilliant. And all we're going to do is just stick these in here. They're quite a spicy sausage, rich in paprika, but they just taste amazing. And now for the red pepper. The basis of a piperade, really, is peppers, red peppers and tomatoes. You don't have to be too fussy with this. This is a, a rustic dish. It's classed as a peasant dish, really, but nowadays chefs just sort of fancy this up. But at its heart, it's really quite a simple dish and one that's perfect to do for something like this for a group of people. Because you can almost just put it on the stove and forget about it. So, peppers in. And now for the tomatoes. 
Now, I do love it here, but I had a quite a surreal experience this morning, and not what you think. I had to go out to the car and get my passport because the lady in the supermarket, when I bought the tomatoes, wanted to see my passport. So just to spice this up, a little bit of chilli. Now I'm going to use some dry vermouth. You can use sherry for this, and I guess that's where sort of the northern Spanish, southern French influence comes in. So each to their own. There are certain rules that you've got to adhere to, and one of which is this stuff, espelette pepper. And it basically comes from the Basque country. It's a type of chilli, type of pepper, not a hot and spicy one, but when they dry it all out, it's very fragrant, particularly important for this dish. You can get away using paprika and stuff like that, but it never tastes the same. So just a little bit of this. Uh, did I mention it's a bit windy around here? <laughs> Sorry, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> the key to this, don't get it in the camera's eye. Quite hot. <laughs> right, bit of water on it. We're nearly there, Rob. Am I still in focus? Bit of black pepper. We put the lid on and we leave it for 10 minutes. Rob, go and sort your eye out. I was promised motorbikes or cars going round. Painting pink stripes. Now, what this needs is some chopped parsley. You chop it really quickly. Now, check this out, Rob. Look at that. Mmm, smells fantastic. In we go with the parsley. Now, it's a good idea now just to check the seasoning. Try and get the black pepper in there. Some salt. Give this a quick stir. Grab the eggs. Just crack them. It's another helicopter. See, this is my idea of heaven, isn't it, really? Food, motorsport, aeroplanes and helicopters. Well, there you have it. It's as simple as that. Once the eggs are cooked, you serve it. Better get changed. That's it. My own special take on pepperade with merguez sausages, poached eggs, parsley, tomatoes, and espelette pepper. Mm -mm. Right, I've served up the grub for my crew. Now, if the chaps behind me have finished painting the track, it's time for me to get racing. Oh, yes! This is not what I had in mind. Yeah, they were still painting the track. But luckily, I love a good roundabout. It's a magical trip, that. I've definitely got to do that again and wheel out the old 2CV. It's magical. Right, still to come, Chef Marcus Waring will be taking over the kitchen duties and I've got a show-stopping dish in store for Josh Widdicombe a little bit later. But after the break, I'll be back in the kitchen with a masterclass class of Christmas nibbles. One, two, three, four, five dishes in nine minutes. Anyway, I'll see you in a bit. Better get ready. Welcome back. Now, I'll be serving up my final course for my guest, Josh Widdicombe, uh, a little bit later. And Chef Marcus Waring will be treating us to a plate of mackerel very shortly. But first, it's time for this week's Little Mask Class. And this week's Mask Class, we're kicking things off in the festive season. We're going to look at Christmas nibbles. That's why these are frying off in our pan. Lots of different bites that you can have at Christmas. You can either take one of these or you can do the entire lot. It's up to you. So I'm going to do about five different things, really. Some sweet, some savoury. 
Uh, we've got some sausages over here, but the first thing I'm going to concentrate on over here is our popcorn. I'm going to do a savoury popcorn. And I'm going to do a bacon and maple syrup popcorn with maple syrup butter, which is a bit epic, to be brutally honest with you. We're going to take our nice little bit of bacon, a little bit of butter, going in here, touch of oil, and we're going to start to fry off the bacon in our pan. Now, what you want to do is just fry off this. This is just smoked bacon, smoked streaky bacon, dry cured if you can get it. That way it'll sort of get that nice little fat crisped up as well. Let's get started in our pan. Now, the sausages, which you can hear, frying off on our pan. I love these. These are small little sausages that you can dive in and eat. Now, you can roll these around in mustard, but if you mix mustard together with mango chutney, this takes it to a different level. Look. Mango chutney, in with the sausages, in with the mustard, like that, a good dot. Stir it all together. And you mix the whole thing together. So you almost want the sausages sort of three quarters cooked, something like that. You mix them all together, and look, you get this gorgeous sticky glaze straight on it like that. Look at that. Easy as that. We move those to one side. They'll quite happily sit there. Meanwhile, over here, then start adding our popcorn. So you just cooked your little bit of bacon, like that. We turn that up a little bit. There we go. And we can pop in our popcorn into this. That'll do. But then what you want to do is pop the lid on before it goes all over the place. Otherwise, it probably looks like it's snowing in a minute in your kitchen. So once you've done that, then we're going to turn our attention to nuts. All right? Spiced nuts. We've got a selection of different nuts over here. There's almonds, uh, there's walnuts, you can use hazelnuts. Entirely up to you which ones you use. These we mix together with egg white. So a couple of egg whites is what you need. A little bit of curry powder in here. I use a medium sort of curry powder, mild curry powder, something like that. And then grab your selection of bits and pieces of nuts there. There we go. Roll them around in here. So you want the spices all to be coated in the egg white. Now the key to that is to actually coat them in the egg white. What the egg white will do is act as like a glue because salted nuts is what you want and you take some sea salt and sprinkle it over the top. And the salt sticks to it, like that. And then all you do with that, you take your, spread them on a tray like this. There we go. And then pop these in the oven. That's all they are. One about sort of five, six minutes in the oven. Nice and hot oven, 220, something like that. They're done. Meanwhile, give this a quick shake. Look at this, frying away nicely. So you've got your bacon now starting to get crisp. We've got the popcorn starting to heat up. Keep going, and all of a sudden it'll start to pop. So we've got the sausages, we've got the popcorn, we've got the nuts in there as well. These are fantastic. Uh, Mikados, very, very simple to make. Puff, uh, sorry, filo paste really, it's base really, these. Very, very easy. So we take our filo pastry, a couple of sheets, that's all you need. With filo pastry, you just got to be careful with it, it doesn't dry out. So. If you are going to use it straight away, just a damp cloth. Not too damp, otherwise it sticks to it. But certainly keep the filo pastry nice and dry, uh, nice and moist, sorry. So once you get to that stage, take another bit on there, we can then grab a little bit of mustard. So a touch of diesel mustard. And you can take your diesel mustard and you can spread this, a bit like a little glue, over the top, like that. See the popcorn starting to open up. And then you use a little bit of Parmesan cheese. Like that, over the top. And then I've got some ham, some dry cured ham. So a Parma ham, Serrano ham, that kind of thing is what you want really. And you can just pop that over the top. Now it's up to you, you can actually take this and pop this over the top if you want, like that. What I do is just get a rolling pin. There we go. And just 
just use that to stick that down. That's purely optional for you whether you do this like this. You can get, take your little feeler and you can just roughly wrap it however you want really, but you can just wrap this all up. You don't have to be too precise. This can go on a little tray. It saves you, you know, rather than do, I mean, you can do your, your nice little cheese straws, puff pastry cheese straws, but these are so quick. A little bit of mustard, remember? You see that lovely little bit of ham. Now, you don't have to do it double thickness like this. You can do it single thickness. It's entirely up to you, but keep your eye on this. Whoa. Keep your eye on it. Just give it a quick shake. And the bacon will actually start to crisp up nicely, which is looking pretty good to me. So that's going on. So we'll carry on doing this. A few more of these as we go. So you can just roll them up. You can sprinkle them with a little bit of salt. You can brush them with a little bit of butter. You don't have to be too precise with this. That's the great thing about this. But the mustard just helps glue it all together. Like I said, you can use mustard or a little bit of butter. It's entirely up to you or a combination of both. But you're going all over like that. There we have it. So you can then, the great thing about these, you can freeze them if you wanted to until you want them. Christmas day, take them out of the freezer, poof, in the oven. No more than about sort of six, eight minutes in the oven. And these cook. Cook them so they're just going light and golden brown. Don't cook them until they go dark brown. <coughs> nice light and golden brown, otherwise they go a little bit bitter. Now, that's all your sort of savoury bits and pieces. Sweet. This is fantastic. Going to do a peppermint chocolate. Really, really simple. You know, you get those sticks that you bite and you get, they, they taste of chocolate, but then you, when you crunch it, you get that crunch, but you get peppermint flavour from it. This is how to make it. Really, not the sticks. That's far too complicated. We're going to keep it uh, nice and simple. We're going to use demerara sugar. Always, always demerara sugar in there. About three or four tablespoons. Peppermint essence. Now, what you want to do is take the peppermint essence, take a few drops of that because it's extremely strong, and mix that together with the chocolate first. Now, it's important to do this bit first because this is the crucial bit that when you bite into it, your each crunch that you get will taste the peppermint. So it's like cross between hospitals and dentists. <laughs> really selling it, I don't know. But that kind of, uh, anyway. Then what you do is you take your chocolate. So as soon as you mixed in the peppermint all in, then we paste our chocolate. Now you can do this with milk chocolate, doing it with dark chocolate, you can do it with white chocolate, it's entirely up to you. But we mix this all together, like that. Make sure the chocolate is not too hot, otherwise it's gonna dissolve our sugar, and that's not good. So mix all this lot together. Take a tray with a little bit of cling film on it. You can use a little bit of paper if you want. Spread that onto a tray. And then what you want to do is take your chocolate and make it not too thick by going right into the edges like that as you're doing it. Pop it in the fridge, pop it in the freezer to set. What you end up with is a massive bar of chocolate. Look at this. Hey, okay. yeah, you go. massive bar of chocolate. Then when you break it all up, you get this amazing flavour from it as well. So we're nearly there with our popcorn. Start to warm up our little sausages, so we get everything all in together. Our chocolate, we can just break up. Look, you don't have to be a fancy. If you want to be fancy, hot skewer, stick it all in it, ribbon, three. <laughs> I don't do that because I've got dogs in here, they'll go crazy from here. But we've got a nice little platter over here, look. And you've got your, oh. So you can take up, uh, so you, when you're serving it, you can break up your, obviously this is sweet and savoury, but all in. We can then take our sausages, start to warm those up. This chocolate's amazing, by the way, like that. So sausages are now warm. We can take these. This is the 
maple glaze and everything else. They can go into that one. Over there. That's the one with the mustard and the nice little bit of mango chutney to go with it. This one, your nuts are now ready. Look, you break these open like this and it all sets on here really nicely. We can then take our tray, put that off. These are fantastic, just warm like this, straight out of the oven. Don't forget a little sprinkling of salt as well, even more over the top. It's a, a little trick that restaurants do with this because it makes you drink a little bit more at the bar. Makes you buy a little bit more, all right? So there you have that. These are not far off in here, but we'll finish off our popcorn now. Bring this over. This is our hot popcorn. So when what we do with this one, we take, you don't want to be shy with the butter in this. So you start colouring the little bit, melting the bit of butter. And then you take just a bit of maple syrup. <laughs> and we mix this together. So you've got maple syrup and crispy bacon popcorn. Like that. And then I'll bring this over and we can pour that into our little pot. So there you have it. You see, you know how quick these are, look. These are now cooked. Easy as that. Now, you can put a little bit of rosemary with it if you want. You can put rosemary with the popcorn. You can put rosemary with a little bit of um, sausages. It's entirely up to you, but a few sprigs of that on the top. So there you have it. Christmas on a little platter. Done. There you have it. Now, if there's anything you'd like to learn about in a little masterclass, then do get in touch. We'll see if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break, but join me again in a couple of minutes when Master Chef, the professional star, Marcus Waring, will be putting his skills to test in this very kitchen. I'll see you in a minute. These are amazing. Welcome back. Now, I'll be wowing my very funny guest, Josh Widdicombe, with one more final recipe very shortly. But first, I'm here in the kitchen with a chef who's become a living legend of the London restaurant scene. He's smiling, but he really is. It's the brilliant Marcus Wherry. Yeah. Where did you get Good that to have you in the house from? again. This is your second time you've been here. Yes, it is. It's kind of been bad the first time, then you're no, back. I enjoyed it. Well, last time you were cooking, you were helping me last time. I know, now you're on your own well, now. We are all on our own. We no. get to see what you like now. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could offload things to you that exactly. I couldn't have time well, to do. Welcome to the house as well. You. You've got a new book with you to talk about as well. Yes. Uh, Restaurant is busier than ever. London restaurant scene is busier than ever now. It's back to normal. It's crazy. It's brilliant. Yeah. It's good. It's a, there's, there's, the, the vibe is amazing. So you're not doing a dish from the restaurant, but we're going to talk no. dish from the book. But tell us what it is first of all. So right? basically, yeah. I, I'm, I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to butterfly the mackerel with different types of, of peppercorn seasonings. Uh, I'm just going to do some crunchy bread and a lovely olive sauce and and some just crushed potatoes. And this was okay. an idea. Well. It's one of those fridge moments when the family says to you, in the first lockdown, there's yeah. nothing to eat, Dad. It's lunchtime. And so I go into the fridge. I happen to have some mackerel from a gentleman who drops them off uh, yeah. through, the, through the lockdown and just trying something different and just going in and just using ingredients. No plan, no recipe, go in. So tell me, that, what was that like for you? I know you can go on and get started start. with this. Tell me what, that, what was that like for you? Because you're used to working hours and hours and hours yep. in a restaurant kitchen. Stop. Now you're having to cook with the family and everything else. What was that? Was I mean enjoyable but frustrating? What was it? What was it? Weird. 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 Strange. Is the way to put it. Yeah. Um, 
Because because the family, you know, they know our food. We, we you know, we eat at family times. The animals at the restaurant and so on. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're all together. Yeah. Um, you've got your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner. Yeah. Um, I don't do breakfast, lunch, dinner. I just sort of do half a meal a day. Yeah. Um, I'm not used to three meals a day. But my family, my wife Jane, yeah, fam and the kids, they all they want their three meals a it day. It is weird when you speak to chefs, though. They, they, they people think, oh, well, you chefs eat big breakfast and then you have lunch. No. Not at all, is it? No. I I I I, I struggled with the eating at the beginning. I didn't. I just couldn't have breakfast, and then what? Lunch? What's the, I just had my breakfast like three hours ago. What's yeah. going on? It's surreal, isn't it? Very so what, are you, what have you got in here then? What? So I've got black peppercorns, white peppercorns, a bit of salt, yeah. some pink peppercorns, and just crushing them together. Okay. This is just basically just going into the into the into the dry store in the in, in the kitchen and just grabbing yeah. some some peppers. Yeah. And, and for me, I like the warmth and the heat it brings, and I think with the mackerel. It just brings in a, a lovely depth of flavour to, to a fish that's incredibly oily, quite yeah. strong, and can carry these type of flavours. Yeah. So just crush those down gently. Okay. Like so. Yeah. So, and to the mackerel. So, what we're going to do is we're going to we're just going to basically butterfly them open. So first of all, we're just going to cut off uh, the, the sort of little fins like so. Yeah. Very straightforward, and that's just to the reason you know for that. I'm not going to take them off. I'm going to take the bone out, the centre bone. Yeah. But I just want to take these off because, A, I don't want to eat them. Um, and you'll see, once I come to fillet it, what I mean. Now, we get many, many chefs here, and I'm quite privileged to that, and, and you're one of them with a CV that is, is pretty cool. You know, your CV Different. from where you worked and everything where you've been throughout your early days. When was the decision that you made, sort of, to... to you were part of that magnificent seven, that, that, that era where mm. it was Gordon, you... Uh, there was, you know, do you know what I mean? There was that... Was that it was almost that mystique around this. No, it sounds great. I know. It's, but, but as a young kid training in the kitchen, yeah. and I was that young kid, you know, looking at, up at you guys and seeing what you're doing, it was, there was a mystique involved in it. When was the decision for you to go, right, I've got to do a place on my own? Because you almost did that all, not together, but quite quickly. We did. And I think, I think the... It, it, I never really had a plan, if I'm, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, things just happened. And... I've, 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 I love the time with Gordon. I love that era of, of the kitchens and the way that they ran in those yeah. days. Things changed, um, and it was always never to step out of the shadow of anybody. It was always just to run a great kitchen. Yeah. And actually, just to be able to sing your own tune and do your own thing is, is, is also quite a nice thing to do. But I suppose you were all at a certain age where if you don't do it now, you're never going to do it. That's that, right. That's right. And that you have to be very thing. careful in cookery that... You've got to stay current, you've got to stay off the moment, and sometimes that change really does help drive you. Yeah. It puts you under a huge amount of pressure to, to perform, but also it, it, it's, I think it's just what we're about. It, it's interesting you say that, but, but people say to me, oh, well, our chefs, the, they say, is it in a competitive industry? It's not, it's not competitive at all. Do you think it's not? In, in, what, in, what, what? in, in a way, you're not competing against anybody else because you're doing your own thing. You know, you're not, you're not somebody else up around the corner. You're not, you're not competing against your own thing. You're competing against yourself. You are, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, very there's true. There's nobody else to beat other than you. But you're also always looking. Yeah, but you're looking at... But that's the interesting thing. You know, you can do all the fancy stuff and you've been there and done it. But it's, it's, there's an enjoyment out of it. You're enjoying it. And I get the feeling you're, you're at that stage now where you're actually... Because you're a different person to what I remember you five years ago. I, I, I the Marcus Waring I remember from ten years ago is not what's standing in front of me now. I, I'd agree with you there. Yeah. Um, yeah, very much so. It, 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 I think, what is that? It's, do you know what, James? Having the opportunity to, to, to write a book, to come onto different TV shows through the years, just the opportunity to be able to go and speak to customers, go and cook in someone's houses, yeah. Just to be able to go and express yourself in all these different, you know, areas of our, of our fantastic industry, it makes you realise how amazing our industry is. Yeah. But that gives you, I mean, 15, 20, 30 years ago, you get chefs on television, you'd never, you just, you wouldn't, it wasn't heard of, no, no, apart no. from the obvious one, Keith Floyd as, a, as an example, yeah. and you never, never thought you'd ever get to that. Yeah. But I think as the years have gone by, you start to mellow out a little bit, you start to enjoy what you're doing, you start to take time, take a little bit of time to I reflect. can see you enjoy it, I can see you enjoy it. So what have you got in here then? What are you making so here? So basically I'm just making, basically, a, a store cupboard sauce. Right. Uh, some tinned uh, green olives, some stale bread, a little bit of olive oil, right. some oregano here, and, and just a twist of lemon. Yeah. And this came about just by wanting some certain flavours 
while I want, you know, I, I, I love this fish. I love mackerel, I love the pepperiness of it, but I also love olives as well. And right. so just creating a dip to put my bread into as well. Okay. I never had a plan when I made this dish. Right, okay. It was just go in and had flavors and ideas. Like, you know. So what's that you got in there, vinegar? Just a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of stock. Right, okay. A little bit of chicken stock in there. Okay. I just put a few little sprigs of oregano in there as well. And I'm just gonna blitz it up with a bit of pinch of salt. And there we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. stop. So I take it this stock comes to the farmers making it so making more of a sauce now. Yeah. with that? Yeah, there we are. Yep. There we go. And that's the olive sauce. You know, you're a Yorkshireman, <laughs> you like sauces, you like to dip your bread I in. Do like, so I, dip, I, I, I do like sauces, I do, I do actually. So this is, this is a recipe from the, the book over here. The, 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 uh, yeah. And this is, this is the one that you've said in, in lockdown and everything else, but with the help of your, your wife writing it as well. Yes, well, that came about just by, the family hanging out in the kitchen. Um, and just, my wife's saying to me, look, you, you're, always, you're always cooking. You never really say much when you're cooking. You just constantly get in the kitchen and do your own thing. I always wanted to write a book from home. I've never been able to do it because I've just never had the time. And yeah. so we started uh, and it just basically went from there. But it was actually quite nice just to be able to do it at home rather than doing it in a kitchen at work or yeah. in, in, in someone's office. Yeah. That's where it really was fun. Yeah. It was fun because the family were around. Yeah. We were chatting, and we just and then and then someone else would go into the kitchen another night, like Jake, my eldest son, burger night or steak night. My daughter baking, yeah. always baking, asking lots of questions. You know the funny thing about my daughter, she will use anyone else's recipes, right. bar mine. <laughs> really? Eight cookbooks, <laughs> and she would go on the internet, <laughs> and she will find anyone's recipes. Which, which is her chef of choice then? You must, uh, she must have a chef of choice. You're pretty much in there too, because you've got a lot on BBC, so you're <laughs> up there. And we do have all your books. That'll wind you up. Um, and, I, and I was like, oh. so we, we had some pretty interesting nights at our What's house. her name? Jessie. Jessie, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Jessie's a big fan, big fan, big, big fan. And she, and, and, and she loves she loves baking, so Delia. Well, she's Nigella. got common sense. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm not going to argue with my daughter, <laughs> and definitely not. Right, I've got some toast here. Yeah. That's got olive oil on, a yeah. bit of seasoning. I'm just going to put that onto the grill. Yeah. So there we are, got the grill. Right. And then the we've got, mackerel, the, we've got yeah. the olive, now we're going to get onto the fish. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to be running out of time. Bit of olive oil. Yeah. So. And like you say, minutes this to, takes yeah. to cook. Really. Completely. So just massage yeah. the oil into the fish, yeah. turn it over. Be generous. I see. I'm, I'm, I'm like you with pepper. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I think the pink peppercorn brings in something different. There's a little yeah. bit of coriander in there too, and and just the white. And, oh, I just think it works really, really well with the fish. Yeah. Yeah. Be generous. Scored. Yeah. Into the grill. Like you say, hot grill right right underneath the grill as right well. Right underneath it. Cook even quicker. Now this will be a test to see whether or not your hot grill is as good as my hot grill. Well, that, you need to shut the door for that because okay. it doesn't work without it. There you go. That's right. not just used to just concentrate right. on your bread. Don't burn your bread. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you need me it's here. A good job, you still. It was all me. going so well. You turned into Miss Cocky there. There you go. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing worse than cooking in someone else's kitchen. You were off. You were uh, yeah, yeah, starting to get a little bit cocky after there a while. We go. There he is. Bread's burning. There we go. It's a good job you're here. <laughs> it's not ready yet. It's not ready yet. Oh, you know that grill, don't you? It's... And it's fine. The grill's fine. Your your grill is working. I know it's working. You were right. Yeah, I know it's right. I don't know why I doubt it is. See, it's always You've got all the mock have ones faith here. To, I've got every bit of gear here. You, you just got to know how to use it. <laughs> I've only been here twice. I've only been here twice. <laughs> don't give me that. <laughs> right. Not in for a while. There we go. Here we go. <laughs> see, look how long was that? Thirty seconds. Yeah, you see, I and mean, it still work. Oh. You just got to have faith. You've got to shut the door. Look at that. There it works. Go. There we go. So this was our. This is our Mediterranean lunch. There we go. So I try to replicate being on holiday with the family. There we go. And the idea, 
You can do this with salmon. I did it with sardines in the book. See, this is, this is where your holiday differs to mine. My fish is usually caked in batter. I'm a Lancashire lad done good. You're a Yorkshireman who's still a Yorkshireman. He's still a, exactly. He's still a Yorkshireman. Nothing exactly. no, wrong with that. <laughs> so there we have it. So my beautiful mackerel with peppercorns, some, some, some fried bread, green olive sauce and some crushed new potatoes. The legend, which is Marcus Warren, everybody. <laughs> Looking forward to this. I slide it all over here. There's a bit of everything I love on here. Bit of sauce. Bit of the old. Get it on the toast. Potatoes, exactly. <laughs> but on the toast as well. And the most important thing, we're not short of we're not short of sauce. No, exactly. Marcus, it's from the book. You're brilliant. That's brilliant. He is a legend. Marcus Waring, everybody. Thank you. Come back again. Absolutely. For a third time? A hundred percent. Fantastic, I'm, I'm exactly. Uh, right, we've got time for one more final recipe. Join me after the break when I'll be serving a very chefy dessert for my guest, Josh Whittacombe. See you in a minute. This is amazing. Thanks for that. Summer sun. Yeah, exactly. In the winter. Well, it needs to be battered, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Sadly, to the last part of the show, I'm back in the kitchen, though, with my brilliant guest, the one and only Josh Whittacombe is here. <laughs> Um, so you had your ravioli, and yeah, you've had it. two glasses of wine, oh, life's a good one. What a day. Uh, and now I'm going to do you a dessert. Uh, right. We're going to do this, this, it's called the apple, and it's become sort of, uh, sort of an iconic dish in my restaurant, really. So I'm going to show you a simplified version. It may okay. not look like a simplified version when I'm making it. You may think, what the hell is he doing? But it's a lot easier than one that we do in the restaurant. So yeah. first thing we do is imagine this in sort of two parts. We're going to do a tartan and we're going to do an apple. It starts off with this thing over here. Now, you can buy these sort of non-stick mats, and I'm going to use these anyway. These are like Yorkshire pudding tins, which are brilliant, uh, much better than the tins. This is apple-shaped. Right. So it may not look like it in here, but the inside of this looks like an apple. All right, bear with me on this. So then what you do is you start off with an ice cream. Now, in the restaurant, we'd make our own ice cream. Uh, we'd mix that together with an apple puree that we cook with caramel for about an hour, add some fresh yeast to it, and when you add fresh yeast to it and you churn it, it tastes like tart tan. So the whole idea of yeah. this, it tastes like the tart tan that you're serving with. But you can take ice cream and you take the ice cream and you stuff it in the moulds. So you can take just normal, just plain vanilla ice cream and in you go. That's it. You see, your, your kids would love this because you're yeah, recently, is... recently two kids now. Two uh -huh. kids. I can, and so far, this is within my skill set. This is this is. Yeah. You just got to find the moles first. <laughs> yeah. All right. But I've got I've got internet. Yeah, you got internet. So, so far, <laughs> so that good. all goes in there as well. Then what you do is you take this and pop it in the freezer. Right. right. And ideally, it wants to freeze overnight for this one. All right? Yeah. So I'm going to go behind the tree, and this is going to go in the freezer. So that's going to go in there. All right. Yeah. So I'll pop that in the freezer now. While that's still freezing, and I've got one that's been yep. freezing there overnight, we're going to turn our attention to over here. We've got milk chocolate, or sorry, white chocolate and cocoa butter. 50-50 of each, melted. Rather than use white chocolate, which is quite thick when it's melted, this is quite yeah. thin. And then this is going to be used to coat the apple bit. All right, right yeah. All right, so we take our apples out now. So these are the ones that have been in the freezer, popped out the mould. Yeah. Oh, well, they and do you, look like apples. Yeah, and then you've got these. Not that I didn't believe you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then what you're going to do is take our bit of chocolate mixture yeah. and then grab this and very, very quickly you can sort of roll it yeah. in the chocolate. Oh, wow. You see it goes really thin like that and almost set straight away. The reason for the cocktail sticks is just a lot easier to take out, but roll it like that and then straight out. In there. So, of all the programs I haven't seen, I've never seen you do a cookery show, sort of Master Chef or anything like that. I reckon this. No, I'd be terrible. Really? I, the stress, the pressure. Yeah. The I stress couldn't... and the pressure. You see, I couldn't do your job. You know, the, 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 to stand up there, I mean, I'm doing theatre tours and bits and yeah. pieces, and you've, you've actually got something in your hand, you're cooking. Yeah. You guys got to go up and there's a mic, there's just you. Yeah, but, you know, that, that's your own thing. You're not being shouted at. 
by chef. That's my fear. <laughs> you haven't got Greg Wallace looking at you like you're a despicable person. <laughs> no, you did. But all you got right. They really, really so that's that bit done. Now on the tart stand. Pink yeah. lady apples, ap uh, uh, sugar, butter, and puff pastry. Very, very simple to make. And we just incorporate the sugar, yeah. which is. So if it's 100 grams of sugar, you take 50 grams of butter. So this is a block of butter. Yeah, simple. And the sugar gone in here. So half half butter to sugar, if that makes sense. And then I'm going to peel the apples and then just make this nice and simply. Now, you're here to chat about the book as well, but you're touring, you've got the podcast as well. So people are just waking up. Tell us about this new book, because you're an author now. I'm an author. What got you into write, writing a book? Was it lockdown that got no, you into No, no. Do you know what? I signed the book deal. I thought, oh, I'm going to write a book. And then there was lockdown, and then every comic in the world wrote a book. And everyone was like, oh, now everyone's doing it. But, yeah, it's a book about um, growing up in the 90s, um, yeah. in the middle of nowhere. And uh, it tells the story of my childhood and the decade, but it's told through the thing I loved the most, which was the TV shows. Yeah, so it's, it's basically... It's kind of the parallel story of my childhood in a very strange place, in the middle of nowhere in Devon, and, uh, and the greatest decade in the history of uh, British culture. So what were your parents into then? Because when you speak to many comedians and that you want to sort of follow suit, what were they doing then? My parents were a couple of old hippies. Right. So, yeah, so they basically let me just get on with my life as much as I wanted. So they were into, like, they moved to Devon to kind of... Cos my mum was into horses, and um, they were just a couple of kind of old hippies that let me do what I want. And a lot of kids would use that to, like, rebel, or yeah. worse. Yeah. I just used it to just sit and watch TV, which is pathetic, really. But I've got a book out of it, so who's the loser? <laughs> but where did you get your love of comedy from? Where did, where did that stem from? Was that through watching television programmes? Yeah, I think it was. It was, I... It was through watching all the TV programmes growing up, and they were always on in my house. My parents were into kind of... Their generation would have been, like, you had Jennifer Saunders and Dawn French and Bottom and all that kind of... And the young ones and stuff, and then all the stuff that I watched in the 90s, yeah. Cos it's interesting now, you look at the stuff that you were into then, but you're into the modern cutting edge of what stuff... We we'll talk about The Last Leg, you know. Although it's been going... You know, mentioned nine, nine years. years. yeah. But it's still relative now to what it was nine years ago. Yeah, I think so. I think we feel like times have changed in a way. Do you know what I mean? You can feel... You can kind of track through times and sensibilities have changed in a good way, I think. And, um, but, like, um, yeah, it's weird to think back that... When we started doing The Last Leg, you know, I remember doing episodes where we were like, oh, my word, Donald Trump's standing to be president. What an absurd idea. And then we did, <laughs> and then we did the whole of his presidency, yeah. and we're still here. We've outlived a lot of things. And doing stuff like that, but keeping it relevant, I mean, it's nothing more relevant than podcasts as well at the moment, because yeah. you've gone on to be a you know, huge, successful podcast. I've been asked to do them. <laughs> what is it like? Is it...? It's great. Yeah? Yeah, because... I mean, I was about to say you can do it from home, but here we are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you but, like, Yeah, it's the best, because I, I think podcasts are brilliant because you get people talking in a long form, which you rarely get in other forms, and you get people being much more honest because I think they feel like... I don't know, there's a way of... Um, that you can't be seen or, you know, it's a longer conversation. So you get these great long conversations. You get little snippets of magic, though, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, and I think people love podcasts because they're... It's like your companion, do you know what I mean? When you go about your day, it's something... It's like your friend to listen to, and so people really, like, identify with them. So, with the apples, you cook yeah. these apples now, and we cook these for about 45 minutes to an hour, gently, gently, gently in the sugar and the butter. Yeah. And eventually it turns into this colour, which then you put in here, top it with the pastry, and bake these in the oven. So, these want to cook... This is the simplified version of this recipe. Yeah. Right there. This is it's... as simple as it's going to get at this one. <laughs> pop these in the oven for about 20 minutes, and then we end up with... These ones that wow. we've got here. So these are our classics on a tart tan. I'm going to pop these back in the fridge, disappear out of the way for a minute, and then bring out the apples over here, like that. And then we can take a bit more of this sauce and warm it up. And while it's still warm, you then pour that over the top. See, that's your sort of tart tanny sauce. That's lovely. Like the ultimate toffee apple, that one. Yeah. And then. You've got these apples over here. Now, to turn these into the iconic apple apple, if that makes sense, yeah. you then take these off. We can then pop these either onto a little tray, something like that. And then what I've got in here... Now, this is what your kids would love. This, yeah. is, this is chocolate in a spray can. Oh, mate. 
This is, this is chocolate. This is cocoa butter. Yeah. With colouring and a spray can. And the idea is you spray <laughs> the apple green. Amazing. And where do you right. can you get just get that? Is you that... can buy it on the internet, yeah. Wow. Like Cocoa that. butter spray. And then you've got the red one. <laughs> so it starts to look a little bit more apple. That's amazing. And you can take it? these little sticks out. You've got to be quite careful with these. You got to take the old cocktail stick out. Like that. Oh, another one. Take them out. Spray a little bit more. Like that over there. So there you nice little. If you put too much red on it, go on with a little bit of green. Just keep touching it up. Yeah, just like that. Right. Look at that. And then you start to assemble this all together. You've got your plate. We've got the classic tart tan. It sits on there. Yeah. Right. This is incredible to watch. <laughs> then, yeah, that's what the chefs say when I said, I'm going to do this for a function for 300. <laughs> Followed by a load of abuse. Um, <laughs> but then what we do is get your little stalks, which you've got in here. So there's your little stalks. You get a little blowtorch. So you're just melting the top of it ever so slightly like that. And if I don't have a blowtorch in my kitchen, if you don't have one, buy one. <laughs> if you don't have one... <laughs> but you... I mean, a pan... Yeah. Oh, look that. at that. And then, one other thing. You take a little bit... sprig of mint. Yeah. Look at that. So there you have it. Your classic tarts tan with its own ice cream. Done. Oh, that is... There we have it. D is, yeah. it is it bad that I feel guilty breaking into this apple? No, well, I'll, I'll break this one, but you, you just take this and you... It breaks, look. Just... Oh, wow. Uh oh That is so good. The apple's lovely, isn't it? It's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I know that's... You're looking for a more kind of descriptive word, but I'm going to say it. It's brilliant. That's all, that's all right. <laughs> thank you very much. That's all you're going to go Well, that's it. Sadly, that's all we've got time for today. A massive thank you to all my guests, Jane Fraser, Daniel Clifford, Marcus Waring, of course, Josh Whittacombe. Yay! See you back here, same time, same place, next Saturday morning. That'll be my house when I'll be joined by chefs Gordon Blackiston, John Williams from the Ritz, and the stars of the hit drama All Creatures Great and Small will be here. Till then, take care, stay safe. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye for now. That's incredible.